So what we hear from people like Bernie Sanders and AOC all the time is that socialism is pro-women. Women want big government programs. They want uh, socialist health care. How do you counter that? How do we let people know that this radical agenda, it actually harms women's ability to thrive instead of helping them? Well, uh, of course, my focus is uh, on uh, senior initiatives and retirement readiness. And the first thing I want to say is that this, this Trump administration has put gold in your golden years and in your future years. Um, too often, too often what's lost in the dialogue is the fact that economic prosperity and economic opportunity are directly tied to your livelihood, to the possibilities and opportunities that lie ahead, and certainly to your retirement security. But we can touch on some of those issues later. I think there is a uh, rhetoric that has drifted to a level of fantasy, um, and that fantasy sounds very attractive. But I also think our team has to do a little bit better in terms of defining what this means. Because I think, uh, I was in the financial industry for about 28 years, and, and I realized a lot of people may not understand what free market means. What does free market economic mean? What, what does, why is there a tie? Why, does it, why do we not really care if Jeff Bezos is worth $100 billion if all of a sudden we've got a lot more coin in our pocket to take care of our family and find opportunities? Bernie Sanders has, has distilled the debate to two things. You're either a billionaire or you're a loser. And somehow he's getting away with that for now. But um, changing that dialogue is something that should be on our platform in a major way. Yeah, I mean, we have a lot of hysteria today in the media about um, a virus, a coronavirus. And I'm not meaning to uh, underestimate that. But I think that there is also a virus that is spreading, that has killed not just 100 million but much more than 100 million people around the world, and that is uh, the socially transmitted disease, STD, of envy. Uh, and that is something that we have to fight. It is uh, the socially transmitted diseases of envy, of entitlement, of victimhood, of greed, as, as my heroine, Ayn Rand, uh, properly defined it, which was the desire for the unearned, okay? They like to call the 1% greedy, but when they're out there pandering and offering a right to your life, okay, where is that in the Declaration of Independence? Uh, the right to your life, who, who has the right to your life? Huh? Does, your, does your neighbor have the right to your life? Does the government have the right to your life? Okay, do you have a right to my life? No. Okay, that's something I think we also need to keep in mind. So at, at the Atlas Society, we focus on philosophy, we focus on fundamentals. I was never an A student in, in math, okay? But uh, I think we need to remember the values. And when we uh, recognized a lot of faces who came out, you know, to oppose some of the socialist policies that have been advanced over the years. And it was because we knew, you know, not just that it would bankrupt the country, but that it was wrong, right? It's just morally wrong. Even if in some fantasy world, socialism did work, it would still just be evil because it infringes upon the rights of the individual and that is our God-given right. And I think you've really touched upon something important there. We are living in a time right now where the crazy idea that people should have a right to their own property is seen as greedy, but advocating that the government should be able to steal from people, other people, is seen as altruistic, right? It's like we're in the upside down. Why do you think this socialist messaging has kind of exploded in the past few years? Because we're seeing um, a rise in people who are saying that socialism would maybe be a good thing, especially among young people. Where, where is this pro socialist agenda coming from? Why is it growing so much right now? I think, uh, well, for one thing, the left started running out of ideas, you know, uh, so they had to kind of shift in this direction. Also, there is a, there is a phenomenon going on as, 
as we see a huge global population participate in the economy. Um, and I think, again, because the left ran out of ideas, they can point to the people that have primarily benefited in large numbers. It's very, it's, it's very good drama for uh, Democrats to kind of say, well, look at these billionaires, um, and so let's go after them because they're causing our hardship, however that may be defined. I also think, and this is just a, a speculation, but as um, unions have declined in power in the United States, as um, uh, certainly public sector unions are now more numerous than corporate unions, and as the world becomes just a little more economically volatile, that again, they're pointing, the pointing fingers part that Jennifer referred to has become the go-to, I think, for the left that they're relying on. So that's why I think we, you know, we conservatives have to really more or less talk about and celebrate the possibilities that have happened. How on earth can we not celebrate the fact that we have the lowest unemployment rates, not only in among women, among Hispanics, among blacks, among um, uh, over 55? We have historic unemployment level, excuse me, employment levels in those ranges. When you look at socialism, uh, who can guess what the poverty rate is in Venezuela? 86%. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Almost approaching 90%. The poverty rate in Mexico, it's not a socialist country considered, but 44%, you know, or so. So you have incredible poverty rates that's never outlined in socialist experiments. And, um, and we have to celebrate the notion that the poverty rate in the United States, by the way, is now almost at historical low levels and has fallen every year since Trump took office to now 10.5%. I, I want to echo what, what Clara said. So at, at the Atlas Society, you know, we, we promote the ideas of Ayn Rand and the moral defense of capitalism with our comment because we... we um, focus on, on young people. So comic books and our animated videos. But one of the videos that I had the most fun in doing was one on gratitude, okay? So I, it's important to identify what are the movers behind socialism, but it's also important to counter them. Mm -hmm. And I think taking a moment to be grateful yeah. for living in this incredible country for having the leadership that we do, for having the economic system that has given us the greatest economic miracle and the abundance, thank you. Well, I, I kind of feel right now that when it comes to the people who are preaching this socialist message, um, n no offense to them, but I, I, I have trouble deciding whether they're being dishonest or misinformed, right? I can't really tell all the time. Um, we hear a lot of mistruths about things like economics, general history, math, just how that those numbers work. Uh, we see questionable things being said about morality as well. What do you think is maybe one of the biggest lies or mistruths that, that we see the socialist agenda pushing forward today, and what can we do to debunk it? Well, certainly I think without question, the, um, the biggest lie, I think, is the fact that uh, socialism creates equality, when it's absolutely the opposite. So I should share with you my parents, I am the daughter of immigrants, they came from the Dominican Republic in the late 50s to escape the dictator Trujillo that had imprisoned my grandfather, they had owned land, took his land, injected him with turpentine, and he died. So I never got a chance to meet him, but they came to this country, and I grew up, you know, really with my parents celebrating, you know, the freedom, you know, in this nation. Um, but again, what's, I, I, I'm a facts and figures gal, so I'll throw some numbers out. The, we make the, notion, that, <laughs> the notion that it's, that it creates equality is so erroneous in most of these socialist nations uh, or socialist ideas, um, the wealthy don't pay any taxes. They move all their wealth outside of these countries, all over South America, unfortunately, that's, a, that's an issue, and Eastern Europe, they move their, their wealth outside of the countries. Only the United States do we really pay our taxes. 95% of people pay our taxes. Um, here, the opportunity level is so vast and therefore the um, economic accomplishments in our country is, is, exceeds any other. Although to, to push back a little bit on that, 
unfortunately, 90% poverty rate, that is pretty equal. Not Correct. in a good way. Correct. But it is. And there's a saying that's <laughs> a Milton Friedman saying. Yeah, that, that, that basically socialism will make everyone equal on yeah. the downside. Right, yeah. You if know, you, for if sure. If you want um, economic equality, you can migrate to Pakistan, you know, or someplace right. like that. They have uh, economic equality. Um, yes, Clara point, points out uh, a really important um, big lie. Uh, of the left, which again, as we've always seen throughout various socialist regimes, and let's not forget that the Nazis were a socialist regime, so that when we uh, tally up the hundred plus, right, that were killed under socialism, let's not forget the six million Jews and the mi millions others that the, the national socialists killed in, in Germany. Um, but in America, under capitalism, if you work hard, uh, and you're smart, and you get some lucky breaks, you have the chance to become rich. And under capitalism, the rich become powerful. Under socialism, the powerful become rich, okay? And there's always a 1%, but under socialism, the 1% are the powerful. It's the ones with pull. So let's, that, that needs to be something that we should put, push back on. Um, in uh, Venezuela, I think Chavez is daughter uh, is one of the richest people in the, com in the country, and, and, and billions, 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 billions in expropriated um, oil wealth were moved to offshore Swiss accounts. Uh, another lie I think that we should push back on is this whole idea of um, the Swedish, Scandinavian, you know, socialist myth. Uh, so, you know, I, I think if... Um, if Bernie Sanders or uh, Biden or Hillary or any of these people wanted to be honest about what really drove uh, economic growth in Scandinavia, first and foremost, it was economic liberalization uh, and it was vast wealth in terms of energy resources. And then, uh, and, and closed borders and, uh, you know, Yeah, and 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 a work ethic, okay, and a Scandinavian Protestant work ethic. So and and then they flirted with socialism in the '70s, and they they saw they saw their their growth starting to to stagnate, uh, and uh, what had happened with the VAT tax, which is essentially the most regressive tax, where uh, they're going to have a, a sales tax on every on every body on everything that is produced. Um, and then uh, uh, income taxes that hit, you know, the middle class. So that's, you know, how they pay paid for their welfare state economy. But it is hardly um, a socialist economy. And until recently, until the Trump cu administration cut the tax rates to make our corporate tax rates competitive, so companies like the company I worked for, Dole Food Company, which uh, had been sold half to the Japanese and half to the Irish, you know, in part because of uh, uncompetitive tax rates to keep these companies here uh, until recently, um, Scandinavia had lower corporate tax rates than America. So that's another lie that we need to counter. And I think we're living in a time where it seems like every time you, you flip on the news, there's a new crazy policy that's being proposed, right? We have people saying, yeah, let's go full on socialist healthcare, further left than what the Europeans have than what Canada has. Uh, we're seeing, hey, let's do tuition free taxpayer funded college, uh, an idea so good that the UK actually had to stop doing it because it didn't work. Um, you know, if you look at the Green New Deal, we see proposals like let's install a minimum income for people who refuse to work, right? We see also Bernie Sanders has flirted with the idea of free internet. There, there are so many things that are being put on the table that sometimes it can be a little bit hard to say, all right, which one do you think is actually the most, the most worrying because it could potentially actually be passed and be devastating for the economy? And I know it's hard to choose from that amazing lineup of bad ideas, which ones we should be most afraid of, but what are your thoughts on that? Well, uh, well, for me, actually, the, um, I spent some time in energy technology. So the Green New Deal worries me the most because the climate change obsession, whether it's true or not, is, is less worrisome than the lack of concrete ideas 
that constantly come out of the climate change panic. So I, I would worry about things like uh, carbon tax. I would worry about things that really unduly hurt. I remember the cap and trade that was tried, proposal that was tried. I wouldn't doubt that if, you know, God forbid a new president came into line that was Democrat, would flirt with that idea again, cap and trade issues. Um, that worries me the most because, as was discussed so well yesterday, Medicare for all, no way, no how. Um, by the way, the Medicare hospital fund is going to be depleted in six years. So we already have a problem with Medicare because people are living longer, thank goodness, you know, but there are fewer workers contributing the payroll tax. Uh, into Social Security and Medicare, which is why we're have, facing some real problems. Have Democrats mentioned that once at all, ever? No. Um, so, so that's why I don't view that as the current threat, but I view uh, anything along the lines of VAT taxes that uh, Jennifer raised regarding Scandinavia or Green New Deal. I think that, the, that, the, that, the, that the, also the energy industry is gonna be unduly pressured. Um, with whatever regulations and whatever taxes might come into play that could call, make that cost. Yeah, and um, I, was, I know of Clara had a vast experience in the energy sector, but um, you know, each of us can also just kind of have common sense and say the government that can't fix the potholes, right, right? in our cities is somehow going to change you know, the temperature of the climate? <laughs> How is that possible, right? So, um, and, and the other thing that, that I think about, you know, one of the left's favorite canards is like Trump and Putin, you know, that, that there's somehow like some collusion going on, Trump and Putin. Yeah, um, Putin controls him, but also Trump's going to go to war with Putin. So it's both, depending yeah, so, so on the it's, it's Depending yeah. on which, whatever, you know, is, is, is better. But, but, you know, Claire can speak um, more substantively to this. But, like, if, if Trump was so, you know, buddy-buddy, bromance, full-on bromance with Putin, um, what has he actually done? You know, he, he got us out of the Paris climate deal, right? He... <laughs> That took guts, okay? Opened up the Keystone Pipeline, deregulated frack fracking, you know, got America energy independent again. Do you think that made Russia happy? I don't think so. And so I'm someone who, I'm a millennial, and when I look at my generation, I'm frankly terrified because I think the number of millennials who are in support of socialism is we've, we've never seen anything like it in the country. And I think part of that is due to things like student debt. A lot of people my age, they're facing tens of thousands worth of student debt, or they're maybe, if they're younger, they're about to undertake a lot of costs. They're, they're worried about that. They would love it if the government would just come in and pay for it all, or maybe they're 25 and they're about to kick up, get kicked off their parents' health care plans. So they're worried about that and they're thinking, hey, maybe Medicare for all would be great. I would be taken care of. For people who um, are in those situations, especially for younger people, how would you present the maybe free market solution to their problems that would address their concerns without saying, yeah, let's just implement full-on socialism? Uh, well, well, there's... Oh, I, I, let me just answer the question in, in, in my interpretation. I think the first thing I would say to a young person is, you know, the first thing you have is the greatest gift of all, which is time. So you have time to take advantage of opportunity, and you have time to take advantage. I'm going to put this in a very specific way, if you don't mind a few numbers. We have the greatest equity market and corporate environment here that the world has ever seen. So it's simply unbelievable how amazing our corporate America is. If you put in, two th let's say you're 25 years old, you put in $2,000 into an S&P 500 index. Every year, $2,000 to $2,500, every year the S&P 500 index. Every year for 10 years, and then you stop at 35. You keep it in the market for 32 years, you will have a million dollars. That is the power of compounding, that we have the most transparent 
corporate environment because we've been through so much. And the good news in America is that when we go through all stuff, all these things and all these turbulent periods like 2008, we change for the better. So you can see what's inside the engine of our economic landscape, where you can't do that in China, in Russia, in so many other places. So you can really, you can really have the advantage of compounding and investing in this country to really make yourself a millionaire. Now, if you already have student debt, you know, if you already are dealing with that challenge. And by the way, there were a lot of movements in the past to really encourage more trade schools to open up and other alternatives. If you notice, you know, and I, I went to Georgetown here and, and you never really hear what the universities explain are the costs. When I went to Georgetown, it was $6,000 a year. I know that wasn't the Stone Age, <laughs> but, um, you know, we're now talking about $50,000 a year. How does that, that's, that's better return than the stock market, by the way, in terms of numbers. So I think um, watching your debt, whatever you do, and there are also many more places in this country to really find opportunity than there used to be. I think there are all kinds of cities that don't have to be New York, LA, and other high cost places to live where you can start a business, start a family, have a really wonderful life. And that's only gonna improve because of all the technological advancements that are taking place. It's only gonna offer more opportunity. So don't create hardship for yourself by taking on too much debt. And invest in the stock market. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess I would also say, maybe you could ask young people, what was the last positive experience you had with the federal government, you know? <laughs> Did you have, what was the last positive experience you had with the, the free market? Like, how, what are those interactions like, and what is it like to interact with government agencies? Um, and then I would also say to us in the room, you know, those with children, those with grandchildren, to, to reevaluate whether or not uh, there is a return on value for sending your kids to, to college. Um, some of the, the, the greatest entrepreneurs, some of the greatest activists, Charlie Kirk is, is uh, one who we work very closely with at, um, at the Atlas Society, you know, he said, nah. College, maybe not so much for me. What is college? Most, most of these uh, liberal arts colleges are indoctrination factories, okay? So big surprise, right, that uh, the, the, the left wants to have government funding for indoctrination factories to make more leftists. Yeah, so. And I think what I, I, what I find so hilarious but concerning is that no matter how high tuition prices rise, those students, they always blame the government, but never the universities. Strange. I, they're protesting in front of government buildings, not university campuses. But um, I, I feel like one of the issues with socialism is it's a mixture of, I think, being naive and maybe being misinformed, lacking knowledge. Anytime I see someone with a Bernie Sanders sticker, I just want to throw Thomas Sowell books at them. Um, that's not always the most practical thing to do. So for the people here who want to get it, yeah. even heavier though. So for the people here who want to get these messages out, but they're, they're aware that you don't always have time for a two hour economic discussion about the pros and cons of socialism. What do you think are the most actionable things they can do um, to let the people around them know about the dangers of what some of the Democrats are trying to push right now? Well, it, well, one thing, well, we're in a group of amazing women that know a lot more probably than I do in so many things. But what I would say is that the Democrats, we need to raise our voices so that almost we embarrass Democratic women, you know, in the sense that, you know, the Democrats assume women are not economically savvy. And conservatives, because we're free market, assume we already know, you know, what we need to know. So I think getting the message out, because to me, like socialism obviously is an encouragement of freedom, but without economic opportunity, you know, you got nothing. So... The point that I'm saying is that I think raising our voices as women, saying, you know, economic savvy, we are, we are economic savvy, your programs don't add up. You know, this isn't a personality change. You know, you're trying to really change the composition of our country and our country's opportunity. So I think really more or less 
remember, you know, sometimes also women don't get enough credit for understanding all the financial decisions that are made, raising your families, working at your jobs, you know, taking care of so many elements. I think raising that profile a bit more is really important because, again, as you saw in the Democratic debates, no one ever added up the numbers that, uh, you know, any of these candidates really proposed, which probably is what led to, I think you all saw that ad yesterday, uh, what is it, Brian, McW Brian Williams? Yeah. The, uh, the YouTube where, you know, the New York Times editorial board uh, columnist was online saying the 500 million, we could have distributed a million dollars to every American. <laughs> so financial literacy doesn't seem to be the strength of the Democratic Party here. So. <laughs> yeah, I guess I would just return to my message, with, which is that we cannot rely on math we need to return to morality. And if I were to uh, give you an answer, how many times does socialism need to fail for people to learn that socialism is not the answer? It's not a hundred times, it's not a million times. It's an infinite number of times because the appeal of socialism is more than fantasy math. It's, it's a moral appeal. So you really need to fight it with the defense of individualism, with the defense of, of free market capitalism, and, and for, with a gratitude for being in America and living in this wonderful American dream. I feel like somehow it's become unpopular to advocate for something like the free market. I always get told that people who support it are cold, heartless, uncaring. Um, we see people have been boycotted, canceled on social media just for saying they don't want socialism. Um, wh what would you say to someone who maybe wants to do these things, come out in support of these ideas, but they're scared to? Uh, you know, it's all, it's, you know, it's, it's basically all in the expression. So I think, um, uh, why waste time saying you're against socialism when you can say you're for economic opportunity? Right. And, um, and put it in a positive framework so that, um, again, as you know, as Republicans, as conservatives, we're always viewed as the anti this and the anti that. Let's be the pro-economic opportunity you know, party. I love that. You know, and let's lead by example. And that's what each of you in this room are doing. Make sure that you're on social media. Make sure that you're on Instagram. Uh, make sure that you're on these accounts. And get savvy with the way that ideas are being transacted today. Um, I, I think that's really yeah, important. Tell stories also. Success stories. However big or small. Again, Bernie Sanders pre keeps pretending that if you aren't a billionaire, you know, you're nowhere. And so I think that's so ridiculous. We can talk about success stories in our, com in our community, how someone started a business or turned a little business around. I mean, and give those examples with uh, increasing, you know, I think with increasing vigor. And remind them to read some, some Ayn Rand, okay? <laughs> but, but because, I mean, what I take as an objectivist is not just the, you know, the politics or laissez-faire capitalism or her, her aesthetics. It's the basic at the end of the day. I, I moved to Malibu 20 years ago. My house burned down. I rebuilt my house. I am like the only red you know, person in, in this entire blue community. I, I, I go to you know, Temple, and I'm, believe me, I'm the only conservative uh, libertarian in, in my entire faith community. Um, but I, I just don't care, right? I really don't care. I don't care. And, and why? It, it, it is because, you know, of my philosophy, because I am, am not an altruist. I, I believe in ethical self-interest. I derive my value from what I accomplish, from what I achieve, uh, and from how I see myself, not how others see me. So that is so incredibly liberating to not care, you know, like, oh, I'm going to offend somebody, or oh, they're not going to invite me to the, their club. Well, good, good. <laughs>